welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. Stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We haven't come to hear from a man or woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Father. As you bless us today, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Bless our brothers and our sisters, our Baptist brothers and sisters and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia Church, The Way. We thank you for San Bernardino Temple, Lord. We bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we see or think of ourselves as better than them. But we bless them, Lord, as you would bless us. And we'll give you the praise and give you the glory. Because we're all in building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. To the praise of God, everybody say amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seat. Get your Bible out. Go with me. To Hebrews, the fifth chapter. I'm going to read to you out of Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse six, but I'm not going to verse six. I'm going to verse seven. I'm reading verse six just to let you know that when we get into Hebrews, the seventh chapter, I will explain Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse six. Did I totally confuse you? Yes, I did. Does it matter? I'm going to read it to you anyway and let you know that I'm going to share with you about Melchizedek in the seventh chapter. Verse number six says this, and as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse seven, this is where we want to go today. Who in the days of his flesh, notice the capital H on the word his, speaking of God, Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered a prayer and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard, let me just emphasize that part to you, and was heard because of his godly fear. That which so impresses me right here is Jesus talking to the Father. Jesus has a connection with the Father. Jesus makes statements that when you hear me, you hear the Father. The words that I speak are not my words, but he that sent me. He had an obvious connection. Jesus makes statements like this for an example. He says, when you see me, you see the Father. They have this tight connection, and yet, even though they have a tight connection, here's Jesus praying. Can I just say something? Did Jesus not know the outcome of what was going to take place? Before the foundation of the world, before the world was ever created, before Adam and Eve ever fell, the plan of redemption was in place. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. What in the world is he even doing talking to the Father in prayer? If anybody didn't need to, Because of his connection, he didn't need to. Yet, as our example, we see him doing this. I want to share with you today something very important for all of us. The need for connecting with God in prayer. I want to share with you today something simple. The title of today's message is the asking prayer. If you don't ask, you don't get If you don't ask, you're not connecting. If you don't ask, you're not bringing God into the center of your feelings, 
but you're keeping him away from the center of your feelings. One of the things that you see with Jesus, he's always connected out of reverence, always connected out of respect for the Father. One of the things you see with Jesus, he didn't separate himself because he already knew who the Father was, already had a connection, therefore he didn't need to continue his connection with the Father. But he petitions on a regular basis the Father. If there's anybody that didn't need to do that, it was Jesus. Yet he's our example, and he shows us that if he needed to do that, how much more do you and I need to constantly connect with the Father in prayer? And how is it that we can go before the Lord and not ask him for things when he truly wants us to ask him for something? God is looking for a people that will just care about him, to want to connect with him, reverence and respect him, that brings him into the center of our passion, bringing him into the center of our need, bringing him into the center of our heart, bringing him into the center of our life through prayer connecting with the Father. Oftentimes, we as American Christians, we don't pray enough, and you know it. Oftentimes, we as American Christians, we have an improper evaluation of prayer. We say, well, God already knows the answer. Why should I pray? Why should I pray? It's too small. I don't want to bother God. I remember praying with one young man. He was a young man whose wife had just ran off to Europe. He was brokenhearted. He asked me to pray with him. I said, I'll pray and I'll believe God with you that your wife will come back and serve the Lord. He said, no, don't pray that. I said, why not? He said, I said, don't you love her? He said, yes. Don't you want her back? He said, yes. But I'm afraid to ask God because if it doesn't happen, then I'll be disappointed in God. Can I tell you something? She came back. He had already gone on somewhere else and missed the blessing of the Lord. All because he was afraid of what God, so he didn't petition the Lord. He didn't ask God for where he was at. Oftentimes we don't ask God, but we have an example of Jesus who knew exactly what was going on, who understood the outcome, and yet he was failed to ask God. My Bible says, man, if you ask, you are going to receive. In fact, uh, if you ask not, you what? You have not. And all through the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, one of the great encouragements that God gives to us who are in relationship with God is that we need to be a people who ask God. No matter how small you think it is, no matter how impossible you think it is, no matter how foolish you think it is, if you bring God into the center of your heart by asking God, God will respond, and I'll prove it to you today. You're going to see some great things in life. I want to take you, if I may, into a situation that's so important for all of us. I want you to see some truths by going with me to Matthew in the words of Jesus. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Will you go there, get your Bible, and go with me to Matthew, the seventh chapter? When you get in Matthew, the seventh chapter, let's start in verse number seven. Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse number seven. Red letter, Jesus speaking. Ask, and it will be given unto you. Now, can I just stop you right there? That's a mouthful. It wasn't me telling you to ask. It wasn't me making a promise to you that it'll be given on to you. This is God himself. Did you know his reputation is on the line? Did you know if his reputation's on the line, his throne is on the line because God cannot lie? So when God makes a statement, ask, and then he says, and it will be given on to you. That is one of the most powerful statements you could ever get. Did you know that everything in the world will come against you to try to keep you from asking for those small little things? You'll be too busy. You'll be too tired. You know, it won't be important to you. You will forget about it. You'll have an attitude, well, it's going to all work itself out. And you'll forget all the time. But God uses this. The first thing he says, here's Jesus himself, ask, 
and it might be given. No, ask and who knows? Didn't say that. Ask and you never know what you're going to get. It would have been okay if he had said that, but he didn't. He said, ask and it will be given. God backs his word to cause it to come to pass. But you and I have got to be a people who understand how important it is that we approach the throne of grace and that we ask with faith and know what God would have us to ask for. Listen to this. Ask and it will be given unto you. Then it goes on and says, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and he who knocks will be open. For everyone who asks, listen to this, receives. For everyone who asks, receives. For everyone who asks, receives. One more time. For everyone who asks, receives. My goodness sakes alive, my friends. How is it that we don't ask enough? We need to petition constantly because we're in relationship with God because we respect and reverence him enough to know that he wants us to ask. He wants us to. He says, and we'll be opened on to him. Verse number nine, and it says, what man is there among you that his son asked for bread, you would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would you give him a serpent? Of course you wouldn't. And we that are human, if our children asked anything, we would give it to them to the very best of our ability. Then he comes along in verse number 11. If then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? See the words good things? How much more your Father in heaven who will give good things Good things, see the word good things? Didn't say wrong things. Didn't say bad things. Didn't say ungodly things, we'll talk about that. Said good things, you know what's good and ungood but God. He's talking about godly things. God, if you ask for that which is God's will, you're gonna get what God wants you to do. If you're not asking for what is godly, you're not gonna get it. Is anybody listening? And the word is ask. Can somebody say ask? Nah, come on, what do we have, five people in here this morning? Did you need your Starbucks or something again to get going? Could somebody say ask? Yes. And that's what this is all about. God is prompting us today to be a simple people that just simply ask God for the little things in life. Could I talk to you about it a little bit more? When you ask God, there's reasons to ask God. So I ask this question, why ask. Four things God wants me to give to you today on why biblically what the Bible says about what and reasons why you should ask. Number one, why ask? Number one, wisdom. You need wisdom. I need wisdom. Look, can we just be honest? I know you don't like me talking this way to you. Let's be honest. We're a bunch of stupid people. We will follow the wrong people to the wrong place and then we will get mad at God for allowing us to go there when he didn't make the choice. We were just stupid that followed the... Has anybody ever followed a stupid person, ended up in a stupid place and you realize that you're pretty stupid to have done that? We need the wisdom of God. We don't need the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world is what we make our choices by. The wisdom of the world is where we get decisions. We make decisions based on our education. We make decisions based on our economy. We make decisions based on the politics. We make decisions based on uh, peer pressure. We make decisions based on everything but the wisdom of God. I need to live and so do you by the wisdom of God and not the vanity of man. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. The wisdom of God helps me to run my family. The wisdom of God helps me to make the right choice for my future. The wisdom of God helps me to build my business. The wisdom of God helps me to act like a good husband. The wisdom of God helps me to be what God would have me to be. The wisdom of God opens doors that no man can open and closes doors no man can close. The wisdom of God brings to me a breath of his life so that I can be what God's called me to be and do 
what God's called me to do. And at the end of my life, I'm fulfilled because I've operated by the wisdom of God and not by the vanity of men's foolish thinking. And you need, and so do I, the wisdom of God. If you don't have the wisdom of God, you will make choices based on the people around you and society and the social things and what politicians and economics dictate to you instead of making the decisions on how to do life by the ways of God. You need the wisdom of God. Is anybody listening? And did you know every day, ooh, hear me, you can ask God, God, I need your wisdom today. And you and I ought to be a people that ask God, God, I need your wisdom. I want you to go with me to 1 Kings. Will you go there? In 1 Kings, the third chapter. Let's take a look at it together. In 1 Kings, the third chapter, we're taking a look, if you will, at a man by the name of Solomon. Solomon is David's son. David is out of the picture, no longer going to be king over Israel. The greatest king Israel's ever known was David. Here comes this man, young man by the name of Solomon. Solomon has got a great responsibility on him. And Solomon, something happens in Solomon's life. Something changes Solomon as well as brings the blessings of the Lord into Solomon's life. You can find out what that is so that you can do what Solomon did so that God's blessings will come into your life. Let me tell you what it's all about. Solomon has got this great responsibility. He's got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that he's responsible for. He doesn't know how to run them. He doesn't know how to take care of them. He doesn't know how to provide. He doesn't know how to be a king. He watched his father. His father had great ability. And now the responsibility of his father is on him. And he doesn't know what to do. Can I ask you a question before I go any further? Do you think God knew where Solomon was at? Do you think God knew about Solomon? Do you think God understood Solomon's heart? Do you think God knew about the future with Solomon? Do you think God knew what was coming against Solomon in the future? Do you know the decisions that Solomon was going to make? Do you think God had an idea about them? Can I tell you the answer to that is God knows everything. He knew exactly what was going on in Solomon's life. Can I ask you a question? Then here's Solomon. Listen to this. He's asleep at night, and God's going to wake him up and talk to him and give him a dream at night. First of all, it's a weird thing that God would do that to this man. Don't you see that as weird? He's asleep. If God wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, I want to ask you a question, I'm saying, could you wake me up about 6.30? Let's talk then. But here God wants to talk to Solomon. There in the third chapter of 1 Kings, verse number 5, something takes place that is really fascinating. God knows who Solomon is, already has the answers for his future, already knows what his future is going to be like, yet God makes a request of Solomon. It's the same request God makes for you and I today. In other words, God knows about where you're going. God knows about who you are. God knows what's ahead of you. God has an idea, knows exactly what you're going to be confronted with in the future, the fights that you're going to have to fight, the faith walk you're going to have to walk. God, God knows all of that. But yet, even though he knows that, he asks a question of Solomon. In verse number 5, and it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, and God said, and God said, he says, ask, what shall I give you? I would have said, God, a Rolls Royce chariot. <laughs> but Solomon's different. He wanted wisdom on how to operate his life from God. And God was so impressed with that, that God gave him everything, including the wisdom. But isn't it interesting that God, who knows who he is, that knows where he's at, 
knows what's coming against him and what he's going to be confronted with in the future, still asks Solomon, ask Solomon, I want you to ask me. Wouldn't you think, God, you already know. God, you already have the answer. God, you've already got it all under control. Why do I have to ask you? And yet God comes to Solomon, first word, ask. He's doing that in your life right now. You need to have such an intimate, respectful position to him that you need to bring God into the very intimacy of your heart and be able to ask him even for the things that are little in your life as well as the wisdom in your life. I like what James says. Go with me to the book of James, right behind the book of Hebrew. And you'll find in James, in the first chapter, verse number five, it says these words. If any man lacks wisdom, hello, if any man lacks wisdom, you ought to put in parentheses, that's me. Certainly it's Pastor Jim. If any man lacks wisdom, that's all of us. Watch this. Let him ask of God who will give it to him liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. And the Bible says ask in faith. Verse number six. You can have wisdom. Wisdom for what? Once you have wisdom, you have to apply it to something. Let me say it again. Once you have wisdom... You have to apply it. You can have all the wisdom in the world and not apply it to anything. Are you following me? You can have wisdom. Doesn't mean you're going to do wisdom. Doesn't mean you're going to operate in wisdom. So we're talking about why ask, which brings us to number two. Number one, wisdom. Number two, life. If I've got wisdom, I need to know how to apply that wisdom to my Life. I don't want to just live a mundane, boring life. So many people in Christendom will just get by with their life. If they're here on the planet. If they just exist, that's okay. That's better than failing. I'll just exist. But that isn't the heartbeat of God for you, and it isn't the heartbeat of God for me. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give how. How, what kind of life? More abundantly. He's not talking about your life in heaven. You're already going to have abundance in heaven. You don't need abundance in heaven. You need abundance right here. When you hook up with Jesus, all of a sudden life goes from boring, mundane, and monotonous to an exciting life and an adventure that accomplishes the plan of God that brings fulfillment in your life. Is anybody listening? So here we're asking God, not only for, if you will, wisdom, I need the life of God. I need the life of God in my marriage. I need the life of God with my children. I, in my case, I need the life of God with my 12 grandchildren. I need the life of God in my business. I need the life of God in my decision-making process. I don't want to live my way according to what I think. I want to live God's way according to what God thinks. I don't want to see things on my scale. I want to see things on his scale. I don't want to experience my acceptance of life. I want to experience his acceptance of life. I don't want to think like I think. I want to think like he thinks. I don't want to live like I think I ought to live like. I want to live like he says I ought to live like. Can I tell you something? When you got life from God, you got fulfillment in your existence on the planet. And I can ask God for life. Let me give you a verse. Zechariah. You say, Zechariah, where is that? Page 1370-something, if you've got a rock Bible. If you don't, too bad. Find Zechariah on your own. And if you don't find it, may I say this to you, just look up on the overhead, the 10th chapter, verse number one. I'm going to read you a little verse. It's prophetic. Starts off with the very first word. 
Could you say it with me? Verse number one of the 10th chapter, first word is ask. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the fields for everyone. You say, where's the life? The life is in the rain. Anytime you see the word water or rain in the Bible, it's the outpouring of the things of God that brings life. That's why at the last he says grass in the fields for everyone. When there's grass in the fields, the herds eat. When the herds eat, the cattle and sheep get fat. When you slaughter them, you have now got a great meal ahead of you. And that's the life he's talking about. Symbolically, the rain represented the life of God. And where there's rain, I want you to hear me right now. You do not have to be in a desert place with your existence. You do not have to be in a desert place with who you are in Christ Jesus and just barely get by. Jesus went to the cross and died for you so that you could have the life of God. And it's far beyond that which you could ever think or you could ever imagine. It's the things of God. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. We're talking about why ask. Why ask for God wisdom? <laughs> why ask for God? Because once you get the wisdom, you got to get the life to put the wisdom onto it. Third thing is you got to have solutions. You have to have answers. You have to have reasons. You've got to have plans. Why ask? Because God will give you the solutions to areas of your life. Listen to me. You will be confronted by problems. There will be things you can't figure out. You will not know how life is going to work. Stop it. Hear what I'm saying to you. This is not just a little bit of a sweet little ride. Man, it's a roller coaster ride, and you better hold on to God and get prepared to fight a good fight of faith. And you got to fight it because you're going to be in battles. But you know if you have the solutions of God, you can rest in the peace of God knowing God is in control. Come on, somebody. I love what Jesus says, Matthew, the 21st chapter. Go there with me. The words of Jesus, Matthew 21. In verse number 20, he's talking to his disciples. He's just cursed the fig tree. You know the story. And he says to his disciples, and he says his disciples saw it, speaking of the fig tree. They marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? And Jesus answered. In other words, life's going to be full of all kinds of problems. There's situations in this life that God has you're not going to be able to figure out. Oh, you'll have the wisdom of God, but you need the solutions of God to go to work in order to have the life of God. Are you following me? All comes by asking God. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Verse 21, immediately after they say, how did this tree wither so fast? Immediately, verse number 21, Jesus starts to speak to him. And he says, assuredly, I say unto you, if you have the faith... And do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you will say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and it will be done. Let me tell you something, that's removing big problems. That's removing and having the solution of big dilemmas in your life. This helps you to get through those times of discouragement, frustration. When you don't know how you're going to make it, I'm here to tell you, God will give you the solution. He's the one that opens doors no man can open. He's the one that closes doors no man can close. When you pray and you ask God for something, but you don't know how it's going to work, have you ever done that? So you don't pray and ask God because you haven't figured it out. Let me say this to you. Stop being stupid. That's what stupid people do. Smart, godly people pray, can't figure it out, and say, that's what faith is all about. I don't know how it's going to work, but I do know, know this. He's my God, and it will work. And then he comes along right after he says that. Verse number 22 says, whatsoever things you ask, whatsoever things you, whatsoever, whatsoever, what, 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 whatsoever, whatsoever, what, what, whatsoever. You say, Pastor, why are you stuttering or something like that? Because I got all of your attention. You thought I was losing it. 
whatsoever. Didn't say whatsoever. You ask, believing, you will receive. There it is again. It starts with asking, then you've got to believe and you've got to see it. Let me give you some basis for that. It's just wonderful because that really takes us to why ask. Number one, I love this, and it's so good for every one of us to see. Why ask? Number one, wisdom. Number two, life. Number three, solutions. But here's number four, why ask? Because it's about anything. Anything. Why ask? Because the word anything is big, and it means his will. In fact, let me talk to you about it for a moment. You can ask all you want, but if it's not the will of God, you will not get it. Can I say that to you again? If it's not the will of God, you won't get it. So why be afraid to ask? If it's the will of God, you'll get it. If it's not the will of God, you won't get it. You have nothing to lose by asking. But let's not be stupid. Let's take a look at scripture. Will you go with me to John in the 14th chapter real quick? We're running out of time. In John the 14th chapter, listen to what it says. In John 14th chapter. Jesus is speaking in John 14th chapter. He says, most assuredly I say unto you, he who believes in me, is that not some of you that are in here? The works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. See the words in my name? It means in his involvement or his will. Give you an illustration. You can't be a woman walking into the building and saying, God, I'm asking for that man. God says, he's already married. Doesn't matter, God, I'm asking for that man. You ain't getting him. Are you following me? Got to be the will of God. Lord, I'm going into San Bernardino, and I'm robbing that bank. I need you to protect me right now, God. (laughs) Not going to happen. You follow me? And it's got to be according to the will of God in the name, where you can put the name of Jesus on it. You know, God, I'm going to do drugs now, get really high, but keep me from dying in the name of Jesus. (laughs) Somehow it just doesn't fit. Some of you, it's been fitting too long. You know what I'm talking about. It just doesn't fit. And so, therefore, it's got to be in the name. So if you know it's the will of God, man, it makes all the difference in the world. Verse number 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But it better be the will of God. You say, well, how do I find the will of God? It's right here. Now, wait a minute. Is it the will of God for you to prosper? Absolutely. Don't let anybody kid you. You say, wait a minute, but the Bible says I should be content. Yeah, you should be content in whatever situation you're in. Doesn't mean you don't have a desire to prosper. Be content until you do prosper. I'm content in whatever, God, until I do prosper. Even if I never prosper, I'm still content. But is it the will of God for me to prosper? Therefore, I can pray to the Lord, God, I need you to prosper my hand. Is it the will of God for my marriage to work? Yes, so therefore I can pray in the name of Jesus about my marriage, my kids, my boss, my finances, the peace of mind, the heart, the the things that want to come in, the anxiety that wants to keep me from living my life the way it is. I can pray the will of God, and God says I'll have it. Now there are things I've prayed for for 25 years I haven't seen yet. And during that 25-year period of time, 
I have many opportunities to give up and quit, but I'm not because I, why? No, it's the will of God. And no, it's the will of God. I've been praying for this church. I'm saying every seat filled in every service. You've heard me say that for years. I have not seen that. Every seat, every service, I just keep adding more services. Every seat, every service, you heard me say it over and over again. Can I tell you, I'm 25 years, but I want you to know something. I will see it because it is the will of God. First John 5, listen, just pop it up. First John 5, take a look at this, verse 14, 15. First John 5, he says, now this is coming that we have where in him. If we ask anything, notice the notice letter anything. You can ask anything. According to his will. According to his will. Is it the will of God for you to be healed? My Bible says by his stripes you are healed. Anything different than that, then shut up and get out of my life because my Bible says God wants me healed. I didn't say you won't go through a battle. I didn't say you won't have times of sickness. I won't say you won't be under attack. But man, I know it's the will of God. And I'm gonna hang in there until I get it. According to his will. He hears us. And then it goes on, verse number 15 says, hey, listen, if you, if you know that he hears us, whatever we, whatever, again, how many whatevers have we heard? Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked him. Man, I tell you, it's settled. Thank you, God. I know it's your will. I've asked you. It's done. It's going to come to pass. Mm. Listen, it's important that you open your mouth, relate with God, bring him into your heart, even to the small things, and ask him. Don't sit back and say, well, whatever. Ask him. When you don't ask, you're saying a whole lot about what you think of him and where you're at with God, and it's not what you want to say. By bringing him in, you're making a statement. I respect, I reverence, I need, I desire, and I'm dependent, and I'm humble enough to ask your will in this, it, boom, you'll get it. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a great big praise. make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. So could I ask every one of you that are up getting ready or thinking about leaving to sit still? We'll let you go in just a minute. Nobody get up. Nobody leave. Let's talk. I want to make sure all of you are all right with God before you go. Here's what I want to make sure. That if you died, you'd go to heaven and you wouldn't go to hell. You cannot get to heaven, listen to me now, because you think you're going to make it. There's no positive thinker who's going to make it. You cannot get to heaven because you're a good person. Think, well, I'm good enough, I'll make it. You're not going to make it. You're going to die, open your eyes in hell, and you don't want to do that. You want to get right with God the right way. And Jesus tells us exactly what the right way is. You say, well, Pastor Jim, I want you to know that my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Took me to catechism. Took me to Sabbath school. Put a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. Let me tell you something. That won't get you saved. What gets you saved is doing it God's way. Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except by him. You can't get there any other way but his way. And today God has a divine appointment lined up with you. That means you've had a lot of appointments in your life, but this is one with God, where you get right with God. And if you should die, you won't go to hell, you'll go to heaven. And you know darn well that's what you want. You want to get right with God. You want to give God what is due you, Him. That means all of your heart and all of your life. In order for you to go to heaven, the Bible makes it very clear. It says you must be born again. John 3rd chapter. Born again means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It is not just mental ascension towards him. Mental agreement with him. I already know you know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. 
that won't get you to heaven. What gets you into heaven is not about what you have in your head. It's about what you have done with your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Now, here's the deal. That's what being born again means. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I'm coming again, and you know he is. He says, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What did he just really say? He just really said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm or not real Christians at all, and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. You're not going to be able to stay in heaven. That is a shock. What's lukewarm? Let me define it for you. Lukewarm is little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. Today, you can make him everything by giving him all of your heart, by giving him all of your life. Being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. It's your call. It's your choice. I can't make you do it. I can only tell you the truth. This is a divine appointment you have with God, some of you that are in here, to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. You've had appointments with doctors, attorneys, and plumbers, and painters, but now you have one with God. Today, it is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Let's get right with God God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and then I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. If you have never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure in this place, I'm speaking to you. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham one time or at a Harvest Crusade. That's great. But did you follow it all up with all of your heart and all of your life, or did you just keep going, doing your own thing? Then today you need to give God all of your heart you need to seriously give God all of your life. You're in a safe and friendly place. Today is your day of salvation. I could just let you go from here because you've been great. You listened great. We worshiped great. But man, I'll tell you what, it wouldn't be a complete service until you get an opportunity to make the turn in the road and give your heart and life to Jesus. Today, it's your day of salvation. God brought you here for this moment. Don't miss this opportunity to give God your heart and give God all of your life. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together, and you get right with God all across this auditorium. All you have to do is raise your hand, as simple as this, put it right back down. You know why? Because he says, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. But if you deny me, sit there like this when you know you need to get your hand up. He says, I'll deny you. It's your call. It's your choice. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hand. There's one. Thank you. There's two, three, four. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Thank you. Back here, twenty-three. God bless you. Anybody else? There's twenty-three. There's another one. Back over here somewhere, they're pointing back over here. 23, 24, God bless you, I see you. 25, God bless you, good to see you, thank you. 25 wise people, anybody else? There's another one right back over here, 26, thank you. Anybody else? Where are you, 27, you know you need to, 27, God bless you, going for God. Just going for God, don't care about what anybody else thinks. 27 wise people, anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 27 wise people.
All 27 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. All 27 of you. Hear me now. If you raise your hand and you're serious about God, you're going to have to do some things. I want you to get your stuff, get your friend, get your, I don't care, just get your stuff. And we're going to stand and no one's going to leave and we're going to welcome you. And I want you to get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. All 27 of you, come from the family rooms, you come. Come from the foyer, you come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. good. Come on home. Come on home. Now listen real quick. All of you in front, I want to point out a friend. Come on up here, Joel. Wave at these guys. This is Joel. I want you to go with him. He's going to do three things. Pray with you, give you some free stuff, tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. We want you to come back to church, get involved. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. You do not want to fall through the cracks. Don't come up in church today and then not come back to church tomorrow. That's like stupid. Let's just go on for God. You're going to give God all your heart. You're going to give God all of your life. Let's go for God, okay? We'll help you go for God. Everybody make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.